vlog out of the past and I'm here in New York City with my good friend Kate Gabrielle. Hi. And we're here to talk about the French film director Francois Truffaut. Now Kate's a huge Francois Truffaut fan so I'm here to talk to her about her love for this director and I want to ask you what was the first time you encountered Francois Truffaut, like a film mm -hmm. or when you had heard of him? Maybe I saw it. it might have been The Bride Wore Black, actually. Oh, okay. Now that I think about it. Possibly. Was that like a long time ago? Or? It was. I've been a fan of his for probably like 11 or 12 years, maybe. Wow. It's been a while. But I think The Bride Wore Black might be the first one. So. It wasn't wow. the first one that like got me into him, though. I think that was Jules and Jim. Like, I think I saw The Bride Wore Black, and, yeah. and I liked it, and it was great and okay, but it wasn't like I was like, I have to see every Truffaut movie after this, and Jules and Jim was the one that did that. What about Jules and Jim really kind of drew you into, like, the world of Truffaut? Um, oh, my God. I love... Jules and Jim is... Other than... Sunday in New York is my favorite movie. Yes. Um, which we all is, know that. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not the best movie ever made, but it's my favorite movie and, like, my go-to. Jules and Jim is what I think is the best movie ever made. I'm um, okay with saying not only is it my favorite, it's, like, oh. the best. Where Sunday in New York, I would not argue that it's the best. Like, yes. I, I'll say it's a fun movie to watch, but it's not the highest quality. Okay. Maybe. Do you yeah. Know I mean? Not to knock on Sunday in New York. I love it. Well, <laughs> but I mean, you know what my I... favorite uh, film is Bachelor Mother, but that's mm -hmm. not, like, on Citizen Kane level. Right. You know? Like, yeah. And I can totally appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So, Jules and Jim... Um, okay, sell this to me, because I okay. watched it recently for the first time, okay. and I felt kind of distant from it, but I really wanted to like it, because, mm -hmm. I mean, it's really kind of um, avant-garde for its time. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have this, like, open relationship with these three characters, and it's, like, amazing how it evolves over the story, mm -hmm. and then that everything happens in those, the like, ending. last ten minutes, or yeah. five minutes, it's yeah. like... What is going on? It's crazy. So tell, so so to sell me on Jules and Jim. So like okay. next time I watch it, that I'll really appreciate it. Okay. What is special about it to you? Okay. Oh. Um, this is tough because I actually rewatched it about a year ago with my dad, and um, he had liked it when he was younger, and then he didn't like it when he watched rewatched it with me, and oh. we were talking about where we couldn't figure out why, like what had changed, and um, you know I don't know if. Like, for me, it's only grown every time I've watched it. I like it more and more. But him saying that makes me wonder if, like, first of all, do you have to have seen it when you were, like, maybe 20 or something to sort of have that appreciation for the, like, vitality of the movie? Because it's very, like, uh, it's, it feels very filled with life. And, like, um, they don't seem to feel like there's consequences to anything that they do. They can just live and... Um, oh, yeah, that's a good point, actually. And I actually, I mean, this... I'm going to have, is it okay if I have spoilers? Okay. Okay. I think, I think at this point you're watching this because you've seen some friends watch Truffaut films. Okay, so spoiler, um, the ending where uh, Catherine is dead and um, the last line is that. Drove off a, a what is it, like a bridge? Like a broken yeah, bridge? Yeah, like a broken bridge. Oh um, gosh, I was like, and, what is going on here? And, and then they, uh, you know, have the ashes. Yes. And, um, and okay, his, okay, so that scene, like, they take their time with the, like, yes. Francois Truffaut really shows you the whole process, which is, yeah. wow. It's I feel like crazy. for its time, actually, yeah. that must have been a lot of people's first impression of what actually happens when you get cremated. Because I don't right. think most people probably realize that bones are still there. Yeah, at the yeah. End. But, um, but the last line when um, they're putting the uh, ashes in the uh, mausoleum and voiceover says that she wanted her ashes to be cast to the wind, but that wasn't allowed. And um, I read somewhere that like that actually sort of encapsulates all of her life where she just kept wanting to go against the grain and oh, yeah. um, kept getting pushback from society, like, you know, that... Yeah, I can get yeah. that because, like, there's that scene where um, she's dressed as a boy mm -hmm. and they're, like, they're running through that, like, little bridge. Yep. And then um, when she's a mom, she's kind of rejecting her um, marriage and she, mm -hmm. like, I think she leaves for, like, six months. And, yeah. Like, she's, like, yeah, you can't contain her mm -hmm. and she can't conform to things. And even like, when she eventually uh, dies um, and kills uh, Jim, mm -hmm. it's right after he says that he was going to marry the other woman. That, uh. You know, and it's almost like... Everybody is conforming, and thing. This is just my impression yeah. of the ending, but it's like that. You know, everybody is conforming. Things are. 
getting to, like they're not running around the countryside anymore as a threesome it's you know he's going to pursue like a normal conventional life frivolity of yeah. their life is over yeah and it's like those playful days are gone right now playful. they're Thank serious you. yes and um yeah like there's a kid involved mm -hmm. there's like well, responsibilities. Weirdly, the kid kind of just like disappears after a certain yeah point. she's just like not there anymore <laughs> but but for a while she's like the fourth partner yeah. really yeah. she's really a part of the dynamic yeah, yeah. So, like, okay, speaking of spoilers, we can just spoil another film. We okay. talk about The 400 Blows, okay. which is my favorite Truffaut film. Okay. And that ending always mm. gets me the when frame. Antoine is like, oh, like, I mean, this kid is just so misunderstood. I feel for him because mm. he's a good kid, right? <laughs> like, he's not a bad kid, but all the adults around him can't handle what's going on mm -hmm. um and then he says at one point oh i do, oh, i've never seen the ocean he says mm -hmm. it to his best friend and then when he escapes the military school and finally gets to the ocean i'm just like <laughs> what i think that might be um i don't know if you feel this way but that mm -hmm. might be one of the best endings i agree movie ever yes i agree <laughs> yeah and you know that was a very like autobiographical movie yes. yeah. so whenever i watch it i end up like i think the first time i saw it i didn't know that then after I saw it, I knew, and every time since then, yeah. I'm, like, thinking about, like, poor little Francois Truffaut, like, all the things yes. that were, like, you know, taken exactly from his own life. It's so, I don't know, it's It adds to sad. it, knowing that it's based on true stories, it, yeah. it's even more impactful, because you mm -hmm. really, I mean, you already feel, feel for this boy. I mean, it's a sad film, but it's also a hopeful film, because yeah. you know that, um... You know, he keeps fighting against these adults, and he'll be okay, you know? Yeah. Um, although, I had to say, so that is the first of the Antoine Duanel cycle. Yes. Um, and what a great first film for Truffaut. That's amazing. Yeah. So, have you seen all of them? Because I know that kind of goes in a different direction. I still haven't seen the last one. Okay. I only have three Truffaut films left that I haven't seen, and that, oh. that's one of them. And I'm like, I'm not ready to say goodbye <laughs> yet. <laughs> like, that's hard. It, yeah, yeah. It's like, um, uh, I think I've put like three years between each one. It's like, it takes me a while. Um, and especially now that the I only have two other ones that are not Antoine Donnell left, too. Yeah. It's like, I'm just... I'm I'm not ready like I want to finish his filmography yeah. and I want to be able to say like I've seen all of his movies but I also just the idea that there's still a couple Truffaut movies out there that are like waiting for me yeah I, you, you'll have those new to me experiences yes. in the future so what are the three that you're, that you're um, still waiting for the last Antoine Janelle I think it's Love on the Run okay I think um, and then Small Change and uh, oh my god what is it called it's not the most beautiful girl in the world. What was it? Maybe it is. Okay. I don't remember. It's a very, like, it's not a well-known one. I should have saved, like, you know, <laughs> day for night for last or something. Oh, right. Like, oh, my goodness. Yeah. I, yeah. I had actually started watching this one because I got, like, a, it's only available in Europe on, um, like, Region 2 or something. Oh, okay. And I have a, like, Region 2 DVD player, and I had started watching it at some point and never finished it. I watched, like... 10 or 15 minutes and then I was like I can't like I was getting so close I think I was on a little binge and I had watched like maybe five or six Truffaut movies that I hadn't seen oh wow and I was like you know what I only have a couple <laughs> left I'm just like saving it and I just watched the beginning and it wasn't it wasn't as good as his other movies which made me a little bit regret that that's one of the ones I saved for last but at least I yeah. have an Antoine Janelle that'll be a good really yeah good you can finish that yeah. cycle and... and actually small change I think is supposed to be really good okay yeah. Okay, I saw Antoine and Colette um, oh, I love after that. I love I'd that. seen 400 Blows. Mm -hmm. What I think is interesting, too, about the Truffaut films is how, like, in that one, you have unrequited love, like mm -hmm. Antoine, you know, he's, I think, 17 years old, he's mm -hmm. living on his own, he meets this girl, and she just does not have the same feelings mm -hmm. for him, but she has, like, kind of the perfect life where she's, um, she has these loving parents, he didn't mm -hmm. have that. Yeah. And I think what's interesting about Truffaut films is he, like, um, the the relationship dynamics, like, Unrequited Love, you see that a little bit with Jules and Jim, mm -hmm. um, tr love triangles, lots yeah. of love triangles in Truffaut films, and then open relationships. Yeah. So are there any films, like, um, that you think capture relationships well, or mm -hmm. you think are like, wow, why did he go there, like, 
um, even something that might have been maybe problematic? Mm -hmm. Well, I know a lot of the relationship stuff would end up, be, a lot of it was based on exper his own experience. Mm -hmm. Like even Antoine and Colette, he did move like across the street oh. from a girlfriend who didn't like him that much and like would go over and spend time with her parents all the time. I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow, okay. <laughs> um, that's, a, that's cool that uh, like so much of his life is in his movies. Yeah, yeah, I love a lot of the things. I um, It's the same as The 400 Blows where I'd watch it the first time, not know, read his biography and be like, oh my God, I remember that. And then I'd go back and watch it. And, and it's like it, ha it takes on a new sweetness yeah. when you know that it was based on something that happened to him. Especially, um, like, he just, he strikes me as such a, like, sensitive, mm. sweet person. And even, like, honestly, moving across from your girlfriend that doesn't like you that much is stalkery, right? <laughs> it's, like, that is problematic. Very intense. <laughs> and, and, um, but, like, reading it about him, I just felt like, oh, poor, yeah. this poor thing, you know? <laughs> like, and I think there was something where, like, he even... He was in the service or something, mm -hmm. and this was the girl, I think, where, um, like, he thought she was showing some sign of interest and, like, deserted or something like oh, that. Oh, wow. Take everything I say with a grain of salt, because it's yeah. been a while since I read his biography, but, like, I remember something like that. Oh, my goodness. It's, it's just, he's such a sweet person. I'm like, also... Uh, after Mississippi Mermaid, uh, he had had a fling with Catherine Deneuve. Okay. And it was like such a, the ending was so bad for him. I think he like had to go to a sanitarium. Oh, wow. But then they ended up making The Last Metro. Okay. So, well, yeah. I mean, what's interesting too about Travaux is he was all in. Like, I remember I was watching this little uh, mini doc about him, and one of his friends said that he didn't uh, he didn't trust people who had hobbies mm -hmm. that were outside of film yeah. because he thought if you loved film, you were all in. Yeah. Um. And but I mean, he loved like he was a big appreciator of like books and mm -hmm. music. I mean, he spent a lot of time in bookstores. That's how he found the story for Jules and Jim. Yeah. Um. But one thing I love about him is that, yeah, like, he just loves film so much. But he yeah. was also, like, wasn't he also, like, one of the harshest film critics ever was mm -hmm. banned from the Cannes Film Festival? Yeah. I, have you ever read any of his uh, his review the, collections? No, or, I haven't. Uh, but I kind of want to now that yeah, I know that. <laughs> there are some insults that are wow. intensely, like, harsh. And some of them were also movies I like. Like, he, I think he didn't, or directors I like, too. Like, he didn't okay. like Rene Clement, um, who did Purple Noon. Okay. Um, and uh, I remember one snide he made about Modesty Blaze, and I think that's such a fun movie. Yeah. I think um, reading it, though, like, when you read his reviews, even if I liked the movie he was talking about, he's so cleverly rude about it. Oh, wow. That you have to kind of appreciate it. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, um, he was... I feel strongly about these movies. Yes. And what do you, what film do you think shows Francois Truffaut's appreciation for, like, film as an art form most? It's funny, because I would say Day for Night. Right, which is very meta. <laughs> right, and because it's sort of like his ode to cinema. Yeah. But I would actually probably say either Shoot the Piano Player or Jules and Jim. Oh. As far as, like, him using the medium the best way that he, like, like sort of his ode to cinema now that he was able to make his own movies. Oh, okay. Because they're just, um, I, I don't know how, I'm so bad at describing it. It's like, when I watch his movies, I'm just filled with, like, pure joy for yeah. them. And it's so hard to put it into words. But, like, there's so many things in the movies that I appreciate. An encapsulation of what he learned from other oh, directors. And, um, like, just say Shoot the Piano Player is definitely, like, an ode to B movies. Yeah. And I love that in that and in Jules and Jim, there's lines where it'll be, like, um, you know, in this part of the... the in, in Act 3, this is happening. Or, like, where they're talking about life as if life is a movie. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Oh, I and see. Things I like see. that. I'm, I'm really, I'm not, it I'm, kind of I'm like, not, like, yeah, saying it well enough, but, like, uh, I get what you mean, because it's kind of, like, embracing the form, like, it's yes, breaking okay. the form, but it's bracing Yes, it. thank you, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, totally I love that it. you're able to get what I'm trying to say out of my, like, gibber. <laughs> you have this yeah. vibe. Now, speaking of Shoot the Piano Player, 
you got to see the star Charles Osborne yes. um, here in New York City a few years ago. Please yes. tell me about that experience. I'm so jealous. <laughs> um, well, I I like distinctly remember when I got the ticket. It was this probably isn't the most interesting story, but I oh, um, no, tell me. <laughs> I was about to go see a movie in Princeton, and I got like a on Facebook. I was just like scrolling before the movie started, and I saw I followed him on Facebook, and I saw he was going to be at Radio City Musical, and I was like, oh my god! And I was like sitting there. <laughs> was like, it an ad serving to you, or no? It, no, it, it was just it was, a page, um, page update. I followed him. Oh, like I see. his I his see. page, and um, you know how Facebook is. I never I didn't see it until like it had been on sale for like oh, a day wow. or so. But I was in the theater like, oh my god. And I was, like, frantically on my phone trying to buy a ticket, and the um, movie was about to start, and I had to put my phone away. And I was just sitting there almost the whole movie, like, oh, my God, like, as soon as it's over, I have to try and buy this ticket. Because it was, like, um, when I got to the website, it was, like, almost sold out and oh, stuff. Wow. Like, I was really worried, and um, as soon as the movie was over, I stayed in my seat, and, and I managed to find a ticket. And it was like... What movie was this? <laughs> I honestly don't even remember what movie it was, because all I was thinking about was, like, Char seeing Charles Aznavour in person. Yeah. Like, are you kidding me? And, um, and then uh, the more exciting part is that I got to go see him. And um, he was just, like... Like, you could tell from Shoot Piano Player, he was, like, a yeah. small, little small guy. And, yeah. and, like, just seeing him come out on stage, just, like, his little frame and... Um, and just like so cute, like yeah. he was cute. I think he was always cute, but like when he was he has older, a sweet and charming personality. Yeah, yeah just so adorable. Yeah. And and like um, his voice sounded like, I mean, he doesn't sing and shoot a piano player. He just plays the piano. Yeah, he just plays the piano. Um, How old was he at the time? Because he passed away last year. Uh, I saw him in twenty. 16. Okay. So it was only just a couple years. Ago. He was like ninety, maybe. It was. Wow. He was pretty old, and I remember thinking like. I mean, it's a horrible thing to say, but when you can see, when the opportunity arises to see someone who's like yes. 90, you're like, this might not come up again. Hey, it's people who go to the TCM Classic Film Festival, yeah. we know this. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's like a horrible thing to have to think, but yeah. like you but do have one chance. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so that was like on my mind too while he was there and just thinking like, what a opportunity and like, I can't believe he's there. Like a lot of times when I get to see somebody live, um, what they say, what they sing, or what they do is, like, sort of pales in comparison to that feeling like they are there in the yeah. same room with me. Like, that is them. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, Did you make the Truffaut connection, too? Like, yes. I'm in the same room yes. as somebody who worked with Francois yes. Truffaut. Yes, I always do that. It's degrees of separation. <laughs> yes, for, I mean, he didn't sing my favorite uh, song. Oh, his, okay. But um, he did so many that I actually wasn't even, like, familiar with. Oh. Um, like, he did, I didn't know he wrote She, but, like, She. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. Okay. Um, I didn't know he wrote it until yeah. he sang it and, and like, said he wrote it or something. And I was like, my God, he's, like, even more amazing than I realized. Like, he was so <laughs> talented. Wow. and And he still uh, just, he had the, his voice was just as amazing as it is listening on albums. And, and he was just so cute and would, you know, like, he did... Sort of like the Frank Sinatra thing where, yeah. like, you sort of talk a little bit to the audience oh, in between that. songs. Yeah, and that's fun. I, I was really far back. Um, it was Madison Square Garden, but it was the uh, theater, not the stadium. Okay. And I was, like, I mean, because I got the ticket, like, when it was almost sold out. I right. was, you know, like, nosebleed section. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, I, I could tell it was him down wow. there. And it was just, it was very amazing. And I, I did, like, think, in addition to the music, like, he was in Shoot the Piano Player. I think I watched it, like, either right before or right after. Because oh, it was, cool. like, that Gotta appreciation. Get in the mood for it. Yeah. yeah. Love him in Shoot yes. the Piano Player. I think, I think he's so... Sen it's very Truffaut-like. He's very sensitive and, like, um, just, like, subtle and mm -hmm. cute and yeah. um, sweet. And you uh, feel for him, too, because, yeah. you know, he's kind of caught up in this bad situation, but it's not his fault. <laughs> yeah, like, it's, it's actually a very, like, Hitchcockian yeah. thing, where it's like he just gets drawn into something when he was kind of trying to mind his own business. Okay. Right. I was watching a documentary, and I think it was Claude Chabrol said uh, there's a scene in The Soft Skin that Truffaut lifted, like, completely from a Hitchcock movie. Oh, do you um, know which one it was? Yeah, I think it's where, like, people are in a line uh, to meet somebody um, or shake their hand. Uh -huh. And I don't remember what Hitchcock movie it was. It might have been, like, um, it's one of, like, Suspicion, maybe, or okay. Notorious, possibly. Interesting. Yeah. Well, well speaking of Hitchcock <laughs> and Truffaut, I mean, like, Truffaut was instrumental in 
um, having people realize how brilliant Hitchcock was because mm -hmm. he really wasn't appreciated. I mean, people just kind of relegated him to like being a director of thrillers with Psycho and all of those films, but mm -hmm. like he really brought Hitchcock to light, especially that amazing sit-down interview that they had yeah. where they just go through his entire career, it's transcribed into an amazing book, which if you haven't read, you should, because it's like film history in a mm -hmm. book, like it's a film yeah. education in a book. Mm -hmm. So like, what do you like about the Truffaut-Hitchcock connection and what mm -hmm. Truffaut did for Hitchcock's career? Um, well, I, I think my favorite thing actually about their connection is the similarity in how they both sort of uh, downplay their own work, which oh, I, I think when you read both of them, every movie they ever made, they'd be like, I wish I had done this differently. Mm -hmm. You know, I couldn't get this actor that I wanted, so I did this actor instead, and it ruined everything. And, mm -hmm. you know, I wish I had ended this one differently. They just constantly critique everything they did about their own work when true. the work was amazing. And yeah. I think it's actually kind of sad that Truffaut interviewed uh, Hitchcock and heard all of this, you know, and heard his favorite director, like, tearing apart his own work a lot of the time mm -hmm. and didn't sort of absorb that and think, well, you know, maybe I just can't see my own greatness in my movies because he did the same thing years later. Yeah. You know, like, you know, I shouldn't have shot Jules and Jim this way. I, you know, did too many zooms on this movie and stuff. And it's just a shame that he didn't pick that up from the interview. Yeah. And so either that or maybe he, being someone who liked Hitchcock so much, thought it was an admirable quality. Right. And sort of absorbed it. <laughs> well, that speaks to both of them, too, how seriously they took their work. Yeah. And how, um how like if they're so critical on themselves it meant that they had very very high standards yeah and what we got was an amazing body of work on both ends yes or not but i just like want to yeah, take, take this opportunity to say his attention to little human things is one of my favorite things about true foot where he'll sort of just show someone shifting their feet and it doesn't have anything to do with the plot it's just sort of like a human thing that he noticed like i can picture him just sort of being on a train and like seeing someone next to him just sort of like shifting their feet around and being like, oh, that's like a, a thing that people do. And yeah. it's like sort of a, a quirk that most people wouldn't include in their movies. Right. And, and I feel like it's sort of a combination of Hitchcock and Truffaut that Hitchcock had all these close ups that would be like, you know, a key or, you know, mm -hmm. someone turning a doorknob where it's like. Or the a, shoes and strangers on a train. Yes, and stuff like, like that. very yeah. extreme close ups, but they were always relevant to the plot. It yeah. wasn't like just this extra thing. And he kind of took that extreme close up of something happening and made it where it can just be like, this is life. Right. It, you know what I mean? So, kind of related to that, I watched two English mm -hmm. girls recently and mm -hmm. there was this really cool story arc that didn't even. Um, have any influence on the characters in the story. It was just kind of an ode to art and to literature, which is the Rodin sculpture mm -hmm. of Balzac. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning, it, it kind of, like, the narrator's describing how um, it's not appreciated by the family. They thought it was terrible. And at first glance, it's kind of like an ugly sculpture. Mm -hmm. But then, um, years later, we get back to Claude. Mm -hmm. And he... Um, and he's there, and it's now the sculpture is um, appreciated as a masterpiece. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was such a cool little, like, Truffaut touch mm -hmm. that he just had this, it's, uh, yeah, like, it really doesn't have any, like, I mean, one of the characters um, wants to be a sculptor, but really that part of it has absolutely nothing to do with the story, it doesn't add yeah. anything, other than this kind of love and appreciation for art mm -hmm. and books of like oh yeah. that sort of stuff is just like makes me so I, happy i feel like even uh in uh the 400 blows antoine Twinell's little balzac shrine oh that yes, he that, yes that he lights a blaze yeah. by accident with yeah. the candle yeah. yes i feel like that too is it's just Truffaut trying to like add balzac love into as many oh, movies as he can that's where, cool right like it doesn't if I'm remembering right, I think that doesn't have a huge amount to actually. No, it just gets like, it gets yeah. his um, stepdad upset. Yeah, but um, it's, but it's like it could have been anything. Yeah, and he, then this little touch. Right, he made it because I'm pretty sure he probably he probably had to have had a Balzac shrine when he was eleven. <laughs>
<laughs> well, even in the film that came after Antoine and Colette, I love how it lingers on the record store, mm -hmm. and you just mm -hmm. see him going through the stacks, and then mm -hmm. he's just, there's like long tables, and there's people like, it doesn't need to spend, I mean, it's a 30 minute mm -hmm. film, it doesn't yeah. need to spend all that time in the record store, but mm -hmm. it lingers, yeah. and a lot of films, especially today, don't linger enough, mm -hmm. and I think that's really cool about his films. Yeah. I think it is, like, they're, they're uh, who am I thinking of? Um... Alain Rene, mm -hmm. uh, I feel like he does the lingering a lot where um, you have to have patience yeah. for the lingering, where Truffaut does lingering in a way where you're appreciating what you're seeing and you don't really feel like um, you want them to rush along. Yeah. Where, not that, like, you're I'm, okay with, with staying in this world for a yeah. little bit. So, yeah. um, so going on a different topic, let's talk about what films of Truffaut's have mm -hmm. you seen on the big screen? Um, I saw Day for Night. Wow. Yeah, and I think everyone I've seen has been, like, filmed, too, which oh. was neat. Like, an original uh, print, not like uh, a, digital. Like, 35, I, I wasn't yeah, sure what I worked it. Okay, yeah. all right. Um, I saw Day for Night at the Film Society Lincoln Center. Nice. And I actually, I, I wanted to see it so bad, I had to catch an early plane to the TCM Film Festival the next day. Wow. And I still came in and saw it and was, like, on the train home at, like, 10 o'clock. That's dedication. <laughs> it, 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 but... That was amazing seeing yeah. And I, like, it was one of those movie experiences where you just sort of, like, get goosebumps. You're just like, oh, nice. my God, this is so wonderful. And um, I saw Jules and Jim at the Museum of Modern Art last year. Wow. And that was amazing. Um, like, I can't... Seeing amazing films in, like, amazing places. That's, yeah. Like, that... <laughs> That elevates experience. I feel like, like, from my own experience, if you can see a movie at the Film Society Lincoln Center at their oh. Walter Reed Theater, that's the best movie-going experience I've had in New York. Oh, their, how come? Their screen is very large. Yeah. They have very comfortable seats that Ooh. are stacked really well, so you don't have any heads in front of you blocking your that's vision. That's nice, Ella. I appreciate that. Yeah, they, they have really good sound. Like, there's some theaters where the sound is a little not as good. Mm -hmm. It's just every movie I've seen there, it's been, like... I feel space. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's cool. Um, and I actually also saw The Man Who Loved Women there uh, last year, the year before. Okay. Um, it's probably like my least favorite Truffaut movie, though. Oh, okay. But I saw it for the first time uh, there. Are there any other films that you're like, you know, I don't care for this, or mm -hmm. I can appreciate it for what it is, but it's not my favorite? Um, The Wild Child, I don't think I would watch that again. It's okay. Very, uh, Truff the only thing is that Truffaut's actually the star. <laughs> Oh. Like, one of the things I like about Truffaut movies is that they're sort of, like, um, even if they're lively, it's, like, a tranquil liveliness. Yeah. And they're, um, you know, the pacing is just, in, like, enjoyable, and they're sort of, like, uh, there's a composure to mm -hmm. the movies. And this one just felt, like, more, because of the kid being sort of, like, yeah. uh, a handful, it's, like, just not, it's not as enjoyable of a movie for me as, okay. as other ones. That's fair. The Man Who Loves Women, it was just sort of like, I, like, Truffaut appreciated women a lot. Yes, you can tell that <laughs> and, in a lot of films. <laughs> and, like, it's fine, you know, like, in a, in a lot of them, there's a lot of appreciation, and it's like, it's okay. But mm -hmm. this one, it's like, okay, calm down. <laughs> a little overboard? A little overboard. <laughs> Good to know. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a little, like, like, uh, spoiler alert, but, like, the guy dies because he's staring at a woman's legs and gets hit by a car. Oh, my God! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, wow! He's, yeah, he's very, like, and, and it's, it's like that, that quality I was talking about from uh, Antoine and Colette where he, like, moves across the street from the the girl because he likes her and stuff, but she doesn't like him that much. It's almost like that, but the guy is, like, 45 and n not as, like, not, it's not as cute anymore. <laughs> but I feel like a lot of it could be the guy he, it's like Charles Denning, I think, maybe. Okay. And maybe if they had gotten a different lead who was a little bit maybe, like, he feels too, almost too imposing where it comes across more creepy. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like that can be a casting thing. If you yeah. get if you get someone who doesn't come across as creepy... And it's not the right dynamic. Um, yeah. Do you have a favorite actor or actress, or both, mm -hmm. of all the Truffaut films you've seen? I have a couple. Okay. Um, I do really like Charles Aznavour in yes. She's a Piano Player. I love Jean Moreau. Especially in Jules and Jim, but I also like her in The Bride Wore Black. But mm -hmm. in Jules and Jim, I just think she's absolutely perfect wow. in every possible way. And I actually, real quick, just, uh, I'm going on tangent again. <laughs> That's okay. But I just wanted to say, like, um, I feel like there's, like, a comparison between Jules and Jim and the Mona Lisa that, oh. um, like, 
the uh, sculpture that they see that um, and inevitably ends up, she reminds them of the sculpture where they've never seen such oh, a yeah. perfect face. And it has this, like, smile that's sort of, like, ambiguous. To me, that's very Mona Lisa-like. Like, like, is she smiling or is she frowning? Like, right. You know, and, um, and then in addition to that, I also think, like, the movie Jules and Jim, this is just me saying this, not that I think it's a actual deliberate thing, it's like the Mona Lisa. It's... Um, a perfect work of art. It's ambiguous. You yeah. don't know if it's smiling. Is it sad? You know, it's um, it's a very it's very hard to read, but it's a great masterpiece. And I think like if they hung up movies in museums, oh. Jules and Jim would be a good one too. Wow, um, that's I, a great I, I, comparison. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, also, as far as favorite people. Uh, Del Mondo in Mississippi Mermaid. In a little oh. bit. You've been to Paris a few times, right? Yeah, twice. Twice. <laughs> now, did you um, go to any places that were Truffaut-related, or did um, you do anything Truffaut-themed um, while you were there? I went to his grave. Wow. And um, it was actually the very first thing I did in Paris. I went by myself, and okay. I, w I was really nervous. When I got to the hotel, I stayed in the hotel room for three hours and was, like, crying because I didn't want to leave the hotel room. I was so, like, yeah. scared because I don't speak French very well. Yeah. Like, I just know a word here and there. Right. And, um, my hotel... And it's a new city, so, yeah. yeah. Um, and my hotel was actually right across the street from the cemetery where he's buried. Was that and on I, purpose, or was that just No, it was... I, I actually went as part of, like, a group trip oh, okay. thing, like a travel, um, not agency, like a group travel thing. Right, right. Um, where they sort of get you to the, the air, get you to the hotel from the airport, they handle like the booking, and, yeah. and you just have to show up. But, um, well, how interesting that it, the hotel was right there. I know. <laughs> and, and that was the first thing I noticed when yeah. I looked like on Google Maps when I found out what the hotel was. I was like, oh my god, Truffaut is right there. Yeah. So I, I had looked on Google, Google Maps to figure out like how I'd walk to get there, and it was like one block up and then like one block over, and there was a little flower shop on the way. Oh. So um, I went in the, the flower shop and oh. I bought a rose. And, um, oh, I love this story. <laughs> and I and I went and found him in the yeah. cemetery and like just sort of paid my respects and left a rose and um, and then when I went back with my mom in 2017, yeah. we were not staying in that area, but yeah. we took a taxi. We were like all the way across the city, and we took a taxi there so that I could do it again, and my mom could be there too. Okay, I challenge you to find somebody who loves Francois Truffaut more than Kate. <laughs> there does. actually were other flowers there too, which was really nice. There's other people that I've were, seen pictures of yeah. the grave with flowers on it, yeah. so I'm sure a lot of people pay yeah. tributes. But I think that's just amazing. <laughs> and, and it was it was sort of comforting too because I felt so alone, and like I was alone. Yeah. <laughs> and I, and it sort of was like um, you know this one French person that means so much to me was like sort of. I sound so morbid and weird, but, like, sort of, like, there for me. Yeah, Do you know what I mean? It was, yeah. like, familiar. Yeah. Once I, like, saw his name there, and it was, like, okay. Like, you can find this familiar connection in a place that's new and foreign to yeah. you. So it that's was, cool. It was very, like, reassuring, and it was just nice yeah. sort of to, like, he's meant so much to me to get to, like, yeah, I get that. go and just be there for a minute. Okay. Um, I did go to uh, a... Um, not a book. It was like a little tiny DVD store. It was really small. And um, this is not true for but my other French love, uh, Alain Delon. Mm -hmm. um, I was like at the register paying for a couple of DVDs, which didn't have subtitles. <laughs> I was just like, I'm in Paris, I'm buying DVDs. Um, and uh, I, I had them on the register and the guy kind of like left the um, counter for a minute. And when he left, he, he had been blocking this book right behind him of Alain Delon that I had oh. that I didn't own, and I was just like, "Oh my god!" And um, and, and it's I was, like a scene from a movie. I know. And I had this like stack of Alain Delon movies I was buying, and um, and he was like, uh, "Oh, you know, you want the book?" And you know, and, and I was like, "Yes." And and um, when he was ringing up the book and the DVDs, he was like, "You know, there's no subtitles," and I said. Uh, yeah, I know. And he was like, oh, you want to learn French with Alain Delon? <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so good. That was one of my favorite experiences. Like, just, yeah. like, getting to talk sort of about Alain Delon with yeah. somebody in France. It was really cool. But um, but in uh, 2017, when I went back with my mom, we got to go to the Cinematheque. Okay. And um, they had a gift store. And I got, like, three or four Truffaut books there. <laughs> my mom found a Truffaut tote bag. 
It's like, wow. um, it says Francois Truffaut, and then it has little drawings from a bunch of his movies on it, and it was the only one that they had. It was like, it was so exciting, and then... It was I, meant to be, meant to yes, be yours. <laughs> I mean, it, it was, again, it was the same reaction that I had when I saw the Alain Delon book. Was, yeah. You know, I was just overwhelmed, and then I also went to, they have, you know, like Larry Edmonds uh, in Los Angeles, they have sort of... A, they have like a cinema bookstore in Paris. Like an equivalent over there, yeah. Yeah, and um, I got a couple Truffaut books there too. Oh. All in French. I can't read them. <laughs> it's just like, I collect like every Truffaut book that comes out whether I can read it so or not. So if there's somebody who has never seen a Truffaut film before, mm -hmm. and you could get them a little starter kit of what to watch first, just mm -hmm. to kind of experience the world of Truffaut and kind of appreciate his work, mm -hmm. what would you put in that starter kit? Um... You know, it's tricky because I would have said Jules and Jim, mm -hmm. but you weren't that... But I had seen it. other Truffaut films before, okay, but and I might not have been in the right head space, too. Okay, because um, I feel like it's a movie where I keep thinking that everybody would like it, and mm. then a lot of people that I talk to aren't liking it as much as oh. I do. So I don't know if I would be the best at recommending. Maybe Day for Night. Okay. Um, would, I mean, it's not actually like that representative of what a lot of people think of, Mm -hmm. When they think of Truffaut, right? Because yeah. you probably think of like the Four Hundred Blows, right. Jules and Jim, like the earlier things. But it's such a and if you know Jacqueline Bisset, that's yeah, she's kind of a nice entry into that film right. too. And and I think actually, if you're not familiar with new wave films, mm. that's actually a very good entry point because it feels more like a studio movie. Yeah, yeah I feel yeah. like it. It's a little bit more. I mean, even the Last Metro too. Yeah, both of them. They feel more like production, like productions that you. would be used to if you watch American movies. Oh yeah, for sure. The Last Metro. Yeah. yeah. Um, whereas like Jules and Jim and Shoot the Piano Player are like different animals completely from <laughs> from <American laughs> Might have to warm up to Shoot the yeah. Piano Player. <laughs> but um Whereas the Last Last Metro was very much a it's very traditional. Like, yeah. Way traditional in comparison to his earlier films. Yeah. yeah. I mean he definitely sort of like over time em embraced that yeah. Sort of like more of a studio system quality to the movies. But I think they still have that Truffaut touch. Yes. They're yes. still, you know, quirky and they're still like sweet and, right. um, you know, like I think I've said this to you before that um, a lot of his movies remind me of like fairy tales for grown ups. They're, they have that quality where like it feels sort of magical and um, light. You know, there there's just something where when I'm done watching one, I feel kind of the same way I would if I had like just watched Cinderella when I was little. It has yeah. it has like a magic to it. Oh, interesting. Um, so I feel like Day for Night, maybe Last Metro, Four Hundred Blows, oh. is just amazing as a film, and the mm -hmm. fact that it's his first. Is I know. Crazy. <laughs> That's what he, I think he said something like everybody has a first film in them. The trick is doing the second one. <laughs> yeah, and the second one was true. To the piano, piano player. player. <laughs> yeah, which, I mean, he had a second and a third and a fourth. Wow. I think he had said that he had like thirty or thirty-five movies in him, but yes. he only got to do I think twenty-four. Mm. I did read that. Yeah. That's one the sad thing about Truffaut is he was taken from us too soon. Yeah. Because um, I, I feel like he could still be alive today, making maybe his last few films. Yeah, you good know? artists still making movies. Good artists still making movies, yeah. exactly. We were robbed. I mean, we only lost Agnes Varda <laughs> recently, like, yeah, yeah, this year. And we got Faces yeah. Places, yeah. you know, just yeah. at the end. And It is so sad. I, there's so many times. She had a renaissance at the end of her life, too, I'm, which was I'm amazing. I'm so glad that she was, like, appreciated yes. and knew she was appreciated. Yes. And it's a shame that, like, if he had lived longer, he really would have had that too yeah you know like I mean he was appreciated but it wasn't the same as like that you know it wouldn't like, have come it would have come full circle if he had lived longer yeah. yeah like like he was too young for there to be the kind of honors and retrospectives and stuff you know what I, I mean no it's like he lived half a life but yeah. at least we have like so many wonderful films and so many of them are available on like the Criterion channel which is yeah. where I just like binged a whole bunch of them yes yeah, they weekend. do have a lot it's amazing yeah. And, yeah. and a lot of them, if you look hard enough, are on DVD. Yeah. Like, um, even if you have to do Region 2. Right. Uh, almost, I think, I think I actually only have two of his movies on Region 2, and oh. the rest were... The rest were readily available? Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. All right, well, thank you for coming on to the channel and thank talking you about your love. Oh, Truffaut. So, um, if you guys don't know about Kate Gabrielle's amazing shop, you have more than one shop, too. You have your Threadless shop, mm -hmm. and then you have your main shop, which yeah. is kategabrielle.com. Yeah. 
Um, she has an amazing collection of art prints and buttons and lapel pins and cards and I have so many, <laughs> I have so many things from her shop. Highly recommend it. She's even wearing a Francois Truffaut button right now, which is awesome. Very on brand. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll leave links down below so you can check out her stuff and thanks for watching. Bye.